Hi, I'm Crystal Franco. I'm a graduate student at Arizona State University in American Indian Studies in nonprofit leadership and management. Um, I'm also a manager at a nonprofit here in Southern Arizona called the Ajo Center for Sustainable Agriculture. Um, I believe in the saying that there is no tribal sovereignty without food sovereignty, or as one of my mentors in this fellowship, Elizabeth Hoover says, um, you can't say you're sovereign if you can't feed yourself. I'm thankful for my previous hands-on food system work in Indian country and now appreciate uh, the opportunity higher education has provided me to work um, in a different level of capacity concerning food systems development. Um, I believe our work as Native scholars is for our people and our communities and I believe that is often missing in academia. Um, at the end of the day we understand uh, that our work is ultimately about um, people and not about data or proving who is right or wrong. And I also believe this is missing from the nonprofit and social entrepreneurial sector. And so my research, um, in my research, I'm using case, the case study method and storytelling to um, show that in a thesis about the difference between um, how native entrepreneurs entrepreneurial businesses run in comparison to a more um, nor what you would see with um, Western people. Thank you so much, Crystal. Next, uh, we have Alexi. Hi, Mish Mintruhi, Skanarka Alexi. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alexi Sagona. I'm a member of the Amamutsun Tribal Band, part of the Ohlone peoples in uh, the SF Bay Area. I'm currently on the homelands of the Ramatush speaking Ohlone today. Um, and I am a second year PhD student at UC Berkeley in the Department of Environmental Science, Policy and Management, Society and Environment Division. Uh, my research looks at access to natural resources and collaborative land stewardship with my community. Uh, we are a federally unrecognized tribe that doesn't hold any land but we have access rights to over 140,000 acres through collaborative partnerships. And so um, my, my project right now is doing some interviews with elders to understand the goals um, and uh, different elements of uh, food sovereignty that is needed and is desired in my community. So just in that first step right now and hoping to develop a, a good program for community members to get out to access lands um, and to develop a good food sovereignty program. So it's really good to be on this call with everyone. I'm really excited to hear about everyone's projects. Thank you, Alexi. Next, we have Joseph. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Peto Washteb Mitakuyepi. Uh, my name is Joseph Gazing Wolf. I'm a first year PhD student at Arizona State University. Um, I work on many different projects, but uh, my primary focus is social ecological resilience um, and biocultural restoration. And essentially those are just fancy words of saying, how do we restore uh, indigenous knowledge and culture uh, on the land and um, in order to produce greater ecological resilience for, for both people and for animals and plants. So I work uh, with the Northern tribes to reintroduce Buffalo and um, sort of work out all the kinks that are necessary to work out in order to make uh, Buffalo a, uh, uh, an element of sustainable livelihood uh, for, for native ranchers. Uh, and then I work in other parts of the world where I look at uh, the empowerment of women's groups, women ranchers and farmers, um, and see what sort of effect that has um, on sustainable livelihoods and uh, ecological outcomes as well. And so I work in the context of locust outbreaks in Africa and Latin America with indigenous groups there and um, looking at how uh, if we empower women with knowledge and resources and governance uh, and research, um, how that affects outcomes in the end with, with regards to those elements of, uh, of ecological uh, resistance. Thank you, Joseph. Next, we have Melinda. Thank you, Kelsey. Uh, a, she, Melinda Adams, Mushle. Hello, my name is Melinda Adams. I'm from the San Carlos Apache tribe from Arizona, and I grew up in Albuquerque, New Mexico. 
I'm a second year PhD student in the Department of Native American Studies at the University of California, Davis. And I also conduct research in the Environmental Policy and Management Department also on campus. Um, so I have a little blurb, I'll just read. Uh, my research focuses on the reclamation of Potwin Southern Wintoon tribes of California land stewardship practices um specifically cultural burning so i work in trying to restore cultural burns getting that good fire back to the grounds here in california um, so i work on the intersection of ecology environmental science and environmental policy um, that's grounded in indigenous pedagogy and methodology so crystal spoke so beautifully on uh, story work and how we're uh, trying to reclaim our land stewardship practices while also honoring our stories that are embedded within the land that are tied to us as indigenous peoples. Um, so I really, really jive with that. And then also with Joseph's work in working with Native women. Uh, so a big push of my work is rematriating these stories and re rematriating our land stewardship roles as women. The tribe that I'm specifically working with is the, the Potwin tribe, um, as I'm on unceded territory here in Davis of the Potwin peoples. And so I'm working with them to restore cultural burns to not only uh, restore ourselves ecologically, but also restore uh, culturally and spiritually those good burns and more specifically working with our food sovereignty systems. So how do we um, get the chuli to burn and, and produce good shoots and good uh, basketry materials that carry our life, that carry our seeds, that carry our medicines, that carry our children. Um, so I'm working with them with cattail, uh, tuli, excuse me, tuli, cattail, elderberry and soap root. Thank you. Wonderful. I don't know about the rest of our attendees listening in on this afternoon's panel, but I know I get goosebumps, even some tears in my eyes to know that this is the caliber of research. Um, and these are the caliber of scholars that are really shepherding what that next generation of research out there promoting resilient and regenerative food and ag systems means in Indian country. So Wopila, thank you all for the very, very um, passionate and um, must be done work that you're leading in your day-to-day -day lives. We have our first question of the panel. Um, can you speak a little to how you identified the appropriate match of college and degree or research topic and, and kind of elaborate on what compelled you to believe that your particular combination was gonna give you a chance to impact the community of your interest? Um, I will kick it over to Tara. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm in the master's program at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health here in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, and so for me, it was kind of a difficult decision to leave my homelands to pursue a degree. And that was definitely a hard decision. But I felt like ultimately it was necessary because the kind of research I want to do with urban Native peoples isn't really happening very many places. And so I needed to go to an institution that allowed independent research at the master's level. Um, so that was a lot of the reason I chose Johns Hopkins, but the other big reason is that they have the Center for American Indian Health that really focuses on community engaged and community based research that builds community capacity to eventually take on this research so that they don't need to rely on academic institutions anymore. And that was really, really important to me. Um, yeah, so I'll pass it on to, I think, Crystal since you would go next. Perfect. Hi, uh, I wanted to speak to this one because I think it's not too an unusual um, for Indigenous students to like be in a position um, that I was in. Like I actually walked away from my first try at university. And so there was like an 11 year gap before I returned um, to finally earn my bachelor's degree. And part of that was just a lot of the, you know, the huge cultural difference of going um, to university and moving um, and start starting off on my own and not having family to rely on and um, coming from um, like I would say like a non-supportive um, environment and, and trying to improve my life um, and so it was like starting brand new in a lot of ways and so um, later in life I did you know, it's a different place. And I'm like, I want to earn that um, higher education um, that I didn't do earlier. And so I knew um, that I needed to make smarter decisions up front about um, choosing a master's 
program. And so I looked um, into our AIS department to see what was going on. And I saw a professor was actually teaching a course on American Indian food sovereignty and food justice. And I took that as a sign, like I meant to go back to ASU and, and to enroll in, in AIS. And that professor is now the chair of my thesis and has been a mentor for me. So I'd like to say from leaving academia and then and going back that I can't say enough for American Indian Studies departments existing and that I wouldn't have gotten this far without that department. And so for those looking into university programs, um, take that into consideration. Are there native professors in the departments and programs that you're looking at? Um, is there a native professor to be on your committee and especially to be on the chair because the chair um, is basically the decision maker concerning your research and thesis within the university system. Wonderful. Thank you. Eva, would you like to visit a little bit about this? Yes, um, similar to Crystal, you know, uh, I, I first was an engineer and then in working in oil and gas and then through some life experiences being disconnected from my homelands, I, I had a real urge to leave my big job at the city and go back to the village. Um, there wasn't really a lot of jobs at the time. And so I spent many years just doing community service and reorienting myself to the community, um, picking up my uh, traditional harvesting practices, you know, like hunting and fishing and preparing those foods, um, singing and dancing, language, arts. And in the place, you know, we're really lucky in Alaska. Uh, my village is on the road system, in, which has been really tough as an Indigenous person. And I grew up out on the land and really surviving off the land. I mean, we ate muskrats for three weeks one time when we got stuck in the woods when the spring it melts out and you can't uh, travel out of there. And so I really wanted to be in Alaska so that I could continue my traditional foods, you know, because that to really be um, indigenous traditional knowledge holder, you have to spend time on in that classroom on the land with the elders. And so I'm, uh, I wanted to remain in Alaska for that reason and at the University of Alaska Fairbanks because I, like Crystal said, I knew that I knew the staff there. I had personal relationships with our indigenous faculty and staff. And we were, and at, a, and at our university, UAF, we have 20% indigenous people. So we are like a real um, powerhouse up here and I, there was a lot of movement going on around indigenous food sovereignty and security. And so I just, uh, I, I chose my university because I knew the people and I knew that the relationships to the communities in Alaska at my university for indigenous people was very strong and that um, there would be a lot of great people to network with. Thank you for that. Alexi, would you like to add? Yeah, thank you, Kelsey. So, you know, I'm very fortunate to have had many opportunities uh, of graduate school near my homelands, and I chose um, UC Berkeley to kind of stay close to the sites that my tribe does stewardship projects uh, near, nearby on. Um, and so the program that I'm in is very interdisciplinary. So I'm able to kind of do social sciences or physical sciences or environmental sciences, um, and it's really flexible. And also the funding is pretty strong and it kind of allows me to do the collaborative work that is identified by com community leaders. And I think that's really important too, is just having that free time to make sure that um, I'm engaging in good relationships and really making sure that um, my project is designed to support community interests and needs. And sometimes um, at programs, a lot of work and labor is expected of you. And it's really difficult to get in those good relationships because of the output and the pressure for that. So. I feel really lucky to be in a place like that. And then also um, since 2007, my UC Berkeley has been collaborating with my tribe. So I, I knew that they were um, good folks there. So I think that was helpful. That's wonderful to hear. It sounds as though you guys kind of all took the chance to look within the community where your interests or your passion 
in serving lied and you kind of observed who was there. And then you also looked outward too, to see what the overlap might be. So working in the space of indigenous systems, what ways have you been able to appreciate and value the observational research mechanisms of indigenous communities while still working in academia? And if anybody has any examples of, of what challenges may exist, maybe we'll start with Melinda this time. Great, thank you. Um, so I think Alexi hit on a really good point that um, his university has existing um, collaborations or project potentials with surrounding tribes. I think that's really powerful because it's not, of course, as we know, it's not um, uniform throughout what we call the United States. And so for me being able to work at UC Davis and it touches a little bit on question number one, um, it's a reason why I'm here and being able to conduct the research that I want to conduct research in. I come from the STEM field. So I have my degrees in environmental science and the reason why I chose UC Davis is because they have one in four of the PhD programs that are offered in Native American studies. And so there's pre-existing partnerships and collaborative projects that are at UC Davis as well. And so um, I think tribes um, being able to engage with universities has been helpful for us scholars that want to engage in that type of observational research um, and also quantitative and qualitative research. Um, one of the things that we're trying to disrupt with our work is, um, you know, we have traditional ecological knowledge, which is a very powerful tool to be able or to enable us to perform the research that we want to perform and be financially supported in doing so. But some of the ways that that could be problematic is that it sort of puts a label on how natives engage in research. Like this is the fit that fits into science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And so some of the work at UC Davis, we're trying to break that and we're trying to engage starting with TEK instead of it being like as an add-on. So centering that, focusing it, talking about native epistemologies, talking about story works, talking about um, our intergenerational knowledge transfers. Those are all valid observations that we as indigenous peoples have always engaged with, always conducted. And so really bringing that to the forefront of how the university defines research, it's been such a, a reckoning, like we've been reckoning with it um, more recently as we're building more partnerships at universities. So that's definitely how I see the role of observation and research, like as a native person and, and getting research off the ground or connecting with existing research partnerships. And then I just had some of the, um, some of the things that might be delaying that, some of the, maybe the problems are finding mentors, right? Finding finding indigenous peoples to work with that want to work on indigenous projects. It's it's challenging because they are probably getting connections from all over. Like there are so few in academia and trying to make that connection, which I'm grateful for um, the IAC fellowship to be able to be connected with those indigenous scholars that are working with food and working with indigenous scholars themselves. Um, so there's access, right? There's this problem for access that native students have to these wonderful native practitioners and native uh, scholars themselves. And so that's definitely what I would consider one of the, the drawbacks, I suppose, in academia is there aren't enough of us, which we all know. And then when there, there is one, there are native representatives conducting this research, getting access to them with their overwhelming schedules and, and they got so much going on. So I would say that that's one of the problems that exists right now. Thank you. Absolutely. Next, we will go ahead and have Eva speak to this a little bit. Yes, this is actually a lot of the work that I do. Um, part of the work I do, I'm in a food security working group that's with the Arctic Observing Summit. So in Alaska, you know, we're, we just had statehood in uh, 59. And so we're still adjusting to these new systems and we're set up differently then the tribes um, in the, call it the lower 48, our lands are held by corporations, for-profit corporations. And so what, um, when we think about indigenous knowledge and this observations and uh, how does that fit into Western science? And uh, that's the problem. We can't fit our observations into this system because they're two knowledge systems and they have equal, not equal, but they each have value. And, you know, indigenous people 
have been observing for millennia and sharing those observations across regions. For example, um, because of climate change warming our waters, we're seeing new species of salmon moving into more northern rivers. And so it, the scientist is not going to find that information out as quickly as I would because in my work as an indigenous scientist and in my work, um, I work with a lot of tribal governments for advocacy. And so we have a network um, in advocacy. We are engaging with these colonial systems that regulate our food sources. So in advocacy, we have to have a network of indigenous people along the rivers, along the ocean coast, and they all work with each other. And so I'm really fortunate to, my dad is, grew up off the land and, he, you know, he's an excellent hunter, fisher and trapper. And a lot of us uh, people, we have access to these traditional knowledge holders in Alaska. We, um, we're still not too far away from eating our traditional foods, but that that is a risk that we are, you know, the challenge is, um, for example, in environmental monitoring, there, there it's, there's a miss between these kind of silos because some people focus on bi biology, some people focus on sea ice, atmos atmospheric um, science, hydrology, and so indigenous knowledge is really holistic, and so these um, it's changing a way of of thinking, and that's the problem that we're seeing. And that um, similar to Melinda, what Melinda was saying, you know, indigenous knowledge can't be this add-on. And so, in our Arctic Observing Summit, we are sitting down with scientists in designing these environmental monitoring programs and saying this is how you monitor and this is how you should adapt um, and so that's that we're really pushing for that change and that we're pushing um, agency funders like the National Science Foundation, the National Institute of Health by writing these letters and white papers explaining the problems with the funding structure, who should be considered PIs, and what is a PhD um, in our culture? You know, our knowledge holders are PhDs. And so our university offers honorary doctorates to our elders as one way of kind of bridging things. And that way people can recognize this person has a doctorate level knowledge. Um, Thank you for that. That's really great to hear. Tara, if you would want to speak next, and then when you're done, I'll have you pop it over to Joseph. Sounds good. Um, I think for me, one of the biggest things is really like remembering my cultural and community role, even when I'm in academia. So my family is storytellers and keepers of stories. So I view research as a way to keep and tell stories from communities and really honor that these communities have always had the answers to our quote unquote health problems, like the community always knows. And so for me, it's been kind of taking time to just be in community and just listen, like not talk, not teach, just sit and listen at whatever community events are happening. And that's how I really got the idea for the food security project was sitting in these different conversations, different spaces, feasts. It kept coming up over and over and over again. And then once I felt like I had listened a lot, I started talking to people and saying, what do you want me to do about this? And that's where I came up with my research design. So for me, it was really just like remembering who I am and my culture as a keeper of stories and then using that to like to, uh, I don't know, guide my own research. Um, yeah, so I'll pass it over to Joseph now. Yeah, um, I, think, I think what I'm gonna say is probably gonna reflect what everyone else has said, which, um, you know, the, when, you, when you work within the paradigms that we grew up in, and you bring those paradigms into Western science, you, you see a great deal of ingenuity and success that you otherwise wouldn't see um, just simply following uh, Western tenets of, of knowledge acquisition. So um, one example, like, you know, I, I told you guys, I work with uh, tribal communities in West Africa, for example, and, you know, when, when I proposed um, 
you know, taking some of the funding that we had and, and supporting women's groups uh, there in order to, to battle these locust outbreaks that are taking place there. You know, in a single day, the word spread through the village and I had a, over a hundred women turn out and, and people were telling me, oh, well, the women wouldn't be interested. They're not going to be interested. You should talk to the male, you know, talk to the, to the male farmers because they're, they're the ones that we've been working with. We've been, you know, communicating with them. They're, they're involved with the governmental agencies, et cetera. Um, and, and, you know, the, the women sort of have more domestic whatevers. Um, and, and I said, well, let, let's try it out, maybe spread the word and see what happens. And I had over a hundred women show up in 24 hours um, and they followed through. They had been the best monitors on the land. They were the ones who worked the land, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, it's, it's already been a tremendous success and we were able to get further funding uh, in order to support them with fertilizer and millet seeds um, uh, to, to keep them going uh, and to keep this project going. And so. Uh, you know, th things like that, uh, where you where you're able to bring in uh, your own perspective that 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 your elders have taught you, and and sort of uh, revitalize the way of thinking that takes place within a Western context. Um, and another example I see uh, in the field quite a bit. Um, you know, when 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 you show up to a field site, uh, if you're a field ecologist like me, uh, you're working you know with a group of of white scholars. You know, the first thing they do is they you know. They pop out of their trucks, you know, get all the gear together. You go out to the field and you start setting up the experiment to start collecting data. Um, and, you know, when I get there, uh, you know, I hopped out of my truck, I put the truck bed down and I just sat in the truck bed and I sort of drove away from the rest of the trucks and sort of sat by myself for a while. And they were just extremely weirded out by that. What are you doing? Like, let's get to work. You know, you're welcome to come join us. Let's, 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 let's get this done. You know, we got a long day ahead of us. And I said, how can you guys possibly know anything that's going on on the land unless you sit and commune with the land? Um, you're, you're here to collect your data so you can publish it, so you can get your accolades at university or whatever, but in what way are you really studying this land? Um, and I can tell that the message kind of went, <laughs> went over, over some people's heads, but, but that's the kind of thing that, that you sort of miss when you don't um, have colleagues like yourselves um, working with, uh, you know, in, in, in a Western context. And so um, kind of reflecting what Melinda was saying earlier, it would be wonderful to see more and more indigenous scholars out there doing this kind of work because um, we individually, we're not gonna be the odd, the odd person out anymore uh, when, when it becomes more normative. Um, and so uh, it's really encouraging to see uh, folks like you kind of getting into this and, uh, and rising up in the ranks. Absolutely. Crystal, would you like to speak to this? And then Alexi? Sure. Um, as a Native scholar, I see that as Indigenous peoples, we already know and understand concepts such as participatory and community-based research methodology and asset-based methodology. And similar to thoughts my cohort, cohorts have shared, um, Things that are considered innovative in academic research are actually traditional mechanisms for us. Um, and so speaking to that, I would say a challenge would be those in academic, academia acknowledging this. Um, for example, in one of my participatory and community methodology textbooks, um, the book is peppered with examples from indigenous and communities of color. So for me, why didn't, why didn't the white authors give entire chapters to indigenous scholars, to scholars of color, to the on the ground community workers and have them author or co-author the chapters themselves? Um, that would actually create a participatory and asset-based textbook. So I thought it was highly ironic to be tokenized in such a textbook. And I like how Ava said that we can't be considered the add-ons in research. I felt that in this textbook, we were the add-ons. Well, Crystal, if you finish, then I'll just um, add here. I think what a lot of folks were saying about the, you know, uh, responsibilities as a graduate student really. Uh, Get close to home for me you know i think i entered into a graduate program because i wanted the letters next to my name so that folks would listen more um, it's something that's kind of a maybe a harsh reality that you know you get more um, respect or acknowledgement if you do that and it's 
kind of a problematic concept that people talk about. Um, and it's also a, a responsibility that everyone carries, you know, of, of trying to you know, do the right thing, but also knowing that your voice is elevated above others, even though it really shouldn't be. And so carrying that, and then it seems like everyone is critiquing that right now and really um, internally thinking about that, that responsibility. I heard Joseph kind of mentioning that as well as some others. So I think that's been really interesting for me too. Um, another thing with my community I've noticed is, you know, there's a lot of uh, aspects of, of healing through stories and um, these really amazing intergenerational events. And, you know, academia is always, you know, forcing us to try to think about theorizing this and talk about healing and defining it and all these different things related to cultural practices. And sometimes it's hard to, to just enjoy it instead of just parsing it down because of the, the pressures of trying to you know, make meaning out of it or, or produce for something. And so I found that to be problematic. Thank you all for speaking to some of the challenges, but it also sounds like you guys are identifying solutions for combining those two different worlds and um, really walking the road that connects them. So thank you for the work that you're doing. And uh, it's, it's inspiring and uplifting to know that you all realize you're going to be the ones, you know, paying it forward in the future that are mentoring the scholars that you're all inspiring on today's panel. We have a third question and depending on time, this may be the last one that we get to, but I know um, it's a trending question in the CVENT page too, where, where people are wondering, you know, what ways, uh, what continued support or resources would you all need um, to continue on in your research journey? What, what fellowships or, or different extra opportunities or resources would help you to carry forward the great work that you're doing? We'll go ahead and get started with Tara. Yeah, this is a great question. I think this is the million dollar question and I think it's going to be different for every single one of us. But I think for me, I grew up as an urban Indian. So I grew up near Detroit. Now I'm in Baltimore and I'm doing work with Minneapolis. So I've very focused on urban native health. And there's just not a lot of research opportunities in urban native health, like a lot of the NIH grants. I haven't seen a single NIH funded grant that's controlled by an urban native community. Maybe they're out there and I'm missing it. But there's really just not a lot of opportunities for it. And there's not a lot of people working in that space, particularly in the food space. So I think my big ask would be that there's urban native specific research and especially urban native food research, because we just really don't understand much of how the food systems interact and how we can get traditional foods to our relatives that are living in urban areas. Um, but other than that, I think honestly, the biggest thing for me is I, I'm very lucky that I have two native women um, mentors and professors at my university and they make this journey so much easier because they can sympathize as being like the only native student in their grad program and being a native woman in a grad program is a whole different thing and like these community roles that we have and we carry with us in academia can be really powerful but also so exhausting when you're doing so much emotional work and these you know these are your relatives that are food insecure and you're asking these questions and it's so hard and you don't get to walk away at the end of the day you know like this is your community um and so I think just honestly having people in academia that are good allies and even non-native allies that are just able to sit with you and listen as you talk through ideas or can let you vent or can give you support on various things. That's really what's made this journey easier for me is just the support of other native um, students, faculty and non-native allies and friends. Great feedback. Thank you, Tara. Eva? Yes, so um, I agree having um, a place to discuss the issues. Um, I, I'm gonna say a word and I don't, I don't know how to feel about it, but it's one thing that we're using is um, a white allies. Um, you know, a lot of people are like, we wanna help or, but they're not, they're not sure how to go about it. And so there is a lot of, um, there's some trainings and kind of information, I think, coming out from like Native Wellness Institute and then the Alaska Humanities Forum. Because um, one thing that, that happens, and I don't know what others experience is this, but in there's a lot of momentum and um, request for indigenous knowledge and dis indigenous perspective. So my experience, I've, I'm overwhelmed with requests to present and I'm constantly doing um, decolonization work. And I'm doing this 
um, and putting in free emotional labor um, to sit in these rooms and, and educate people on, on what, how do you incorporate indigenous knowledge? How do you respect it? And a lot of times these conversations are happening after money has come to the table instead of thinking about um, equity and, and getting that money into the hands of the people who are providing the knowledge instead of this extractive process. So one thing that I do in my work is I provide honorarium to my traditional knowledge holders. So an elder that does an interview with me is going to receive a um, um, cash check for contributing knowledge. And they're also going to review what it is that I'm sharing and reporting um, and also have access to the, to the data. And so we're having to do that uh, through our university, through IRB. So one thing that a university could do to help is have um, some type of IRB research protocols with indigenous communities. Um, and then also like these funding structures, uh, you know, our university is being very proactive and forward thinking in supporting uh, the indigenous scholars in going after funding and um, actually writing these letters to the National Science Foundation to say, uh, we can do better work, but not with this funding structure. And, the, and so we're really focusing on the relationship building um, and also storytelling, you know, that is a, a really key thing, I think, in indigenous culture is that that's what that's how our knowledge is kept. And so if you think about a report and you're trying to edit down your text, you know, that's why oral storytelling is such a great form of sharing knowledge, because you can contextualize so much and, and narrate it. And when you have to remember something and speak it, you really understand it. Um, so the, those different ways of communicating, allowing different academic products to be developed, not just journal articles, but also digital stories or uh, guides for researchers or, or manuals for the community. What, what is the community needing? What type of information do they want and in what format? That's very helpful. Thank you. Crystal? Uh, is it fair to say that um, I'd like to meet in person with everyone? <laughs> um, that is support and resource I would love. Um, I'm so hoping that this COVID-19 issue clears up soon enough where we would be able to do that and have an in-person meetup as fellows and mentors and with the IAC. Um, for those watching and listening in the audience, um, I will ask um, that you remember us and reach out um, to the IAC and let us know about in-person conferences and events and help us plug back into a sense of community and, and normalcy once COVID-19 has passed. So that's, that's my request. <laughs> A great request and one thing that I'm going to add to the 2020 to do list to try to figure out how to make it happen when it's safe again. Alexi. Thank you. Yeah, I think I want to just um, add on to what Eva was saying and talk about IRBs because um, I think that's a really good tool um, and I think tribal governments themselves um, forming IRBs could be one way to make sure community based research is good but overall, um, I think I've uh, been looking for support for how to do community engaged research and how to make sure that everyone's voices are heard and doing it in a respectful way, um, acknowledging, you know, how some knowledge is private. Um, and then also, you know, figuring out how academia can knowledge, uh, can acknowledge and value this work. Uh, oftentimes, you know, publications are the things that are seen as important and those get you hired uh, in the higher positions but really trying to show that community-based work, which takes a lot of time, lots of hours and hours to do it in a good way, should really be valued. And it seems like that's still something that's lacking today. Great insight, Joseph. And then we will finish off with Melinda. Yeah, um, kind of reflecting what others have said too. I, I think two, 
two really important things that I see moving forward uh, as a scholar for me would be, um, I actually thought about seeking out funding to develop some kind of a, a searchable database that people can go on where you can, you know, let's say I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about proposing a new project and I want um, scholars who are like-minded, say indigenous scholars or, or allies who are like-minded um, who care about indigenous communities, you know, I can go on that, that database and search uh, and be able to find people that I can work with and, you know, uh, connect with and say, hey, let's, let's propose this project together and work on it. You're an expert on this particular subject matter, et cetera, because a lot of the problems that we need to solve will require inter interdisciplinary research. And so, you know, I, you know as, as an ecologist, um, I can't solve every problem. Um, I, I need people who are, you know, social scientists, um, et, et cetera. So uh, it would be really great to be able to kind of go out and connect with others who are already doing that kind of work and support each other that way. Um, and then the, 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 other, um, the other thing that I, that I was thinking about is what Eva mentioned earlier, which is, you know, we, we have to publish our work within a Western context still, right? So, so we don't have journals that specifically appreciate the way of, ways of knowing that we grew up with. And so, you know, in my mind, again, um, you know, are, are these things that we're going to have to form ourselves, um, you know, journals that, um, that, that appreciate storytelling um, and, and, and see that as a valuable way of, of, um, of communicating knowledge? Um, are those things that we're going to have to find funding and, 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 and form ourselves? Um, that's something I've been meditating on, on recently um, because you know I'm, I'm in the process of publishing data that I have say on on bison on on prairie dogs you know important important relatives up up in the high plains and you know if I put them if I put any tinge of indigenous anything uh, on this article that I'm sending off and send it off to a traditional ecological journal you know I, my collaborators were like are you sure you want to do that because we're probably going to get rejected <laughs> I was like. Okay, well, let's do it. Whatever the white way is, as if doing it. Let's get this over with. You know, like it's, it's unfortunate, but that's that's kind of the state of things, at least in ecology. So, um, so it'd be great. Yeah, it'd be great to have, you know, outlets where we can share our our data, our information, you know, uh, our stories, and have that devalued for for what it is. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Joseph and Melinda. Yes, all wonderful suggestions from my colleagues. I think we all cross pollinate quite a bit in identifying the resources that could help us like elevate our work and help uh, build agency for ourselves as indigenous scholars working specifically with uh, food sovereignty and food systems. So me just, just being a dreamer, like I have some practical resources that I wanted to point out, but also some structural resources that touch on why we need uh, practical resources. So the first ones, I think my colleagues did a really great job in identifying uh, financial support. Like anytime you can support native scholars, no matter what we're studying, that's always going to go a long way in getting more of us into the doors of academia. And that might not be for everybody. And I just do want to be clear, like with our participants, our, our community members, you know, our rising scholars that might be thinking about college, um, it's very different from us in our communities. You know, we don't view experts of, as having these degrees and as going away to college. And so I do want to, to point that out. And it's been great in working with IAC specifically because we do connect community supporter, uh, community uh, researchers, folks that are in the community engaging in this work that we're all studying too. So they have a very vital role in all of our work in and beyond our work in academia. And so I did want to point that out. Um, Financial support, I touched on this earlier, access, access to these indigenous scholars that do support indigenous scholar work. Um, so it's been great to network within the mentors that we have in the IAC, as well as the INFAS mentors that are um, connected throughout the, what we call the United States. And so that's been wonderful to have access, but getting more native students access to those experts and being able to identify one another at universities Again, that's gonna go a long way in getting more um, indigenous youth into college and um, being successful in those roles. Um, social support, I really appreciate how we can just get together and start to talk about our research, but then veer off and start to talk about our experience in graduate school. Like that's been, that's been medicine for me and healing for me. Like just hearing my experience and then having Crystal share her experience and have it be the same and have us be, you know, kind of complaining about the same things <laughs> and just, Knowing that navigating these systems is not easy and having that, um, that kinship relationship within our cohort has been, has been so powerful for me. So those are my practical asks and I do want to leave 
this because I believe we have people that may be native, may not be native, they may be in academia, they may not be, we have allies. And so I just wanted to leave with this message. Um, so ways that we can support not only this fellowship opportunity, but other, um, you know, fellowship opportunities, excuse me, is when we think about, um, um, we think about our role in academia and what that means and the status of academia. You know, there's a high country news article that came out about land grab institutions and how are they paying back like native peoples whose land they stole to be able to conduct this research or have this university that's situated on native lands. Like, how are you going beyond the land acknowledgement statement and really giving back and recognizing native peoples? Well, there are a couple universities that are reinvesting that money back into recruiting and retaining more native students, but we can't just start there. I mean, we have to start with what they're calling cluster hires or having multiple uh, indigenous identified peoples come and work on the campus to build that visibility and build those coalitions of native peoples that are at universities to attract the students that they need to study and then become successful and then become maybe tenure track professors there. And so I think these are just big system problems that hopefully we can help with in changing that for you know people that follow our younger generations. But I, I did want to at least say that, um, and as it's part of our conversations, I'm sure it's part of part of all of our circles, being at university institutions, being at land grab institutions. And so I did want to identify those structural changes that hopefully we're we're in the era now where we're starting to talk about you know, paying back and paying rent and being able to support Native students in and beyond academia. So thank you. Absolutely. Well, what a wonderful, honest, um, dynamic, rather unique, but uplifting panel that um, I'm so fortunate to be able to join in and moderate today. I'm super duper, duper, duper proud of all of the work of our IAC InFAS fellows. We are in our first year of our IAC InFAS fellowship. And I think um, if, if this group has set the stage for what is to come, we are really truly looking at a bright future of culturally relevant, um, observational based, uh, community uplifting and healing research that is on the horizon that already has been on the horizon but is starting to spread so thank you all for the work that you guys are doing thank you to all of those individuals um, that are probably tuning in watching that have supported our IEC infast fellowship and who are going to be hopefully doing all that they can to continue to reach out to these young um, scholars that are doing great work for Indian country I wanna take one more moment to thank uh, the sponsors of the IEC conference. This session is sponsored by our Champions of Native Agriculture sponsors. So go ahead and, and join in on the CVENT website and take a peek. And now we are getting to the time for our closing session. So if you are um, still tuned in, I would encourage you to, once you leave this session, please join us at the top of the hour for our closing session on our CVENT website. Thank you all so much for joining us and thank you to our panelists today. You knocked it out of the park.